thunder rumbled in the distance as the last of the storm pelted rain down on the roof of my apartment. My dog, Ducks, an incredibly dopey but lovable German Shepherd, was desperate to go outside to attend to his business. He had been afraid of the thunder and didn't like getting wet, so coaxing him out of his hiding spot in the closet took several treats and the gentle promise of a nice walk in the cool, dark night. With had a look that said he didn't quite believe the storm was done. He came out of the closet and let me put the leash on him. A moment later, we walked down the apartment steps and headed towards the woods where Ducks loved to walk. As Ducks sniffed at everything in sight, I stared down into my phone, checking Twitter for the latest nonsense and controversy. I wasn't paying much attention to Ducks as he typically led to where he wanted to go. I'd occasionally look up to get a handle on where we were. However, this time, it was this low, guttural growl coming from him, which got my attention. Hearing him growl while playing around with a tennis ball, I knew the difference between his playful, in-the-moment growl, and this one certainly wasn't it. This one came from the primal, undomesticated DNA of the wolf still deep in his genes. Before I could say a word, Ducks took off running into the woods. The sudden pull knocked my phone out of my hand, and I had no choice but to allow him to drag me where he wanted, even as I protested and yelled. Ducks was undoubtedly onto a scent, and he wasn't going to let it go until he found what he was looking for. As he pulled me deeper into the wet and cold woods, I tried to assert myself as the dominant one, but Ducks didn't care. He was like trying to hold back a force of nature like the storm which had only just passed. Ducks paused for a moment to put his head on the ground, and then was off again. His tail went stiff and stood straight in the air. He led me to the middle of a small patch of open space surrounded by trees and raised his head up to the top of a particular tree. He growled and barked and jumped against the trunk of the tree as if he was trying to knock it over in a fury. I took hold of his collar extra tight and pulled him away from the tree, scolding him for his behaviour. It was a sad attempt to rein him in. For the first time since he was a puppy, he bared his teeth at me in defiance and uttered a guttural rumble of a growl as if to warn me to back off. And also, for the first time since owning ducks, I felt afraid of him. I didn't know what was up with him. Did the storm drive him crazy or something? What the hell was going on? Once he realised I wouldn't be pulling on the leash anymore, he went back to barking and attacking the tree trunk. I stood there like an idiot, defeated and feeling scared of my dog who cowed away from bicycles, baby strollers and balloons. Here, he was snarling and battling with a random tree in the woods. To this day, I cannot describe the sound I heard that came from the tree branches. It was something between a screech and a chitter. Just as quickly as Ducks was this brave and unstoppable Cujo-like mad dog, all the aggression left him. He turned back into the closet, carrying dope he was. Except this time, his ears were down, and his tail was tucked between his legs. He cried out pathetically and urinated, before running back to me and getting as close as he could to me for protection. When I looked into the tree, all I saw were dozens upon dozens of little red glowing orbs, and then they started to buzz like cicadas in the deep summer heat. Those red orbs shook, and I realised they were coming down the tree. Fleeing in a panic, Duck sprinted ahead of me, showing me the quickest and safest way out of the woods. I only had the dim light of the overhead lights near the apartment to guide me. Ducks used those animal instincts to get us out of there fast. The sound of those creatures followed close behind with an ever-increasingly loud hum. I reached the edge of the forest, having to dodge ducks constantly as I walked, as he kept weaving between my legs again. As we reached the parking lot of the apartments, I gave one peek back into the woods to see the red orbs had conglomerated into a large mass, fluid in its movement as it hovered over the houses ahead. From where I stood, it looked like an opening in the clouds, revealing a patch of obscure space sprayed with thousands of pulsating red stars. Then I noticed other, similar patches forming mid-air in the distance. 
The overwhelming humming, combined with the roaring sky, stripped Dux of all his will to move further. I pulled on the leash to no avail. He glued himself to the ground, his claws stabbing deep into the muddy surface. I had no other choice than to pick him up in my arms, carrying him like a baby down the path to my apartment building. As the noise emitted by the strange floating body continued, it soon got the attention of the people living in the apartment block near the woods. The streets began to fill with people. I shouted for them to get back into their homes, but it was futile. They stared in awe at the manifestation above, and then the buzzing cloud came down, collapsing over the gawking people. Their gaping mouths ingested the soup of dark matter and red dots, while their bodies ended in a state of a violent convulsion. Men, women, and even children in pajamas kicked their legs in agonized pain. Their heads crashed into the ground roughly, over and over again, as if shattering their skulls would ease their suffering. The sound of the torment joined in with the abyssal hum of those red-eyed creatures. There was nothing I could do for them, and with dogs in my arms, I had no other choice but to escape from the madness into my own apartment. I ran between many cars, checking behind me to see that nothing was coming for us. My limbs were aching by the time I got to the back door of my building. Dugs was not a puppy anymore, and I was not in my best shape. The second his paws touched the floor inside the apartment, Dugs launched towards the sofa, sinking deep beneath it and the wall. I crashed onto the couch to catch my breath. It felt as if I'd run a marathon. My lungs burned, my throat felt dry. I felt sick to my stomach, thinking about what happened to those people. Whatever was happening, I imagined it expanding beyond the confines of my apartment complex. I needed to call the police. I reached into my pocket and felt nothing but empty. I'd forgotten I dropped my phone. There wasn't a landline in my apartment either. Who uses landlines these days? There wasn't anything else I could do except approach the window with caution. I didn't expect to see my neighbors across the street returning to their houses while the orbs hummed away towards the forest. They walked towards their doors as if nothing happened. My next thought was to call my friend who lived in one of those houses. And again, I reached inside my pocket and shouted in anger that my phone was gone. At that moment, someone knocked on my door and Dux growled from behind the sofa. My first instinct was to follow my dog's lead and hide away behind the sofa. Another knock. Dux whined and slid deeper into the shadow. Sweat gathered on my brow. Knock. 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 It wasn't a particularly aggressive sound, but I just witnessed the entire neighborhood feasting on a swarm of glowing insects. Some paranoia seemed to be an appropriate reaction. Hiding behind the couch wouldn't solve any problems though. Another knock. I stepped toward the door and squeezed one eye against the peephole. On my front porch stood Sally, my next door neighbor. Just a few moments ago, she had been out there in the street next to the others, her face covered in tiny crawling bodies that squeezed into her open mouth, her nostrils, her ears. Now she looked like nothing had happened at all, just a friendly old woman with dark grey hair and a bright smile. She raised her hand and knocked again. Yes, I managed to say. It's just me, she answered. Just wanted to check in on you. Didn't see you with the others. Everything all right. I kept you some if you need them. What? I said, my mind racing. I said I'm worried. Can you just open the door? I took a step back and froze. My eyes flickered toward the cowering form of the German Shepherd peeking out from beyond the sofa. The thought of ducks charging at Sally quickly left my brain. Hiding wasn't an option either. The blood was rushing to my brain. My heart was pumping so damn hard, I heard it in my ears. Knock, knock, knock. Stop with the damn knocking, I thought in my panic. I gazed through the peephole again. Just Sally. Just my old neighbor. Thin, with a bent back and a head smaller than mine. Was there really anything to be afraid of? I fumbled for the knob, latched the chain on the door, and cracked it open slightly. 
Sorry, I'm just a bit under the weather, I said. I didn't know what to do. Should I have told her what I saw? Should I have played dumb? I stumbled over my words as I searched for the appropriate response. I, um, I just fell asleep, so I'm just a little... I'm okay, though. I'm fine. Oh, her eyes widened. Oh, you were sleeping? But tonight was... You missed the... Don't worry. She rummaged through a bulky, hand-knitted jacket. Don't worry. I didn't see you, so I kept some. You're fine. You're going to be fine. Her shaking fingers pulled out a tiny jam jar, and she wanted to hand it to me. Not wishing to stir up any trouble, I unlatched the chain, and my hands reflexively accepted the little container. I lifted the glass up to my eyes. It vibrated in my hands. There was that sound again. That sound from earlier. Fingernails scratching against the inside of a coffin. The screeching tires of a distant truck as the driver loses control. A giant buzzing fly being slowly squeezed until its kite in a shell cracks. Red squirming lights danced within the see-through prison. Their bodies angrily bounced back and forth as they tried to escape. In shock, I let loose and the jar shattered on the floor underneath. What the hell? I threw myself backwards as the lights rose up into the air, swarming in the form of a tiny tornado. What the hell's going on? The insects slowly dispersed one by one. They vanished towards the forest. Sally looked at me with wide eyes. Her hand squeezed against her mouth. Oh god. She took in a deep breath. Oh god, how many did you have last time? How much did you forget? She tried to take a step towards me. But before she could get anywhere close, I slammed the door shut in her face. Behind me, Ducks was going crazy. One second, he was racing towards the door with his teeth bared. The next, he was carrying in the corner, shaking and whimpering. Wait, wait! Sally kept hammering against the door. It's not too late. Maybe we can find some if we go into the woods right now. Please, they'll be back next month. You'll be okay, I promise. My legs turned to jelly beneath me. I stumbled back to the couch and sat down in a daze. Sally continued beating against my front door, but the sound faded into my periphery as the world washed away into a quiet, whistling sound flying past my ears. My stomach twisted violently. A moment of clarity sent me struggling to the bathroom as the contents of my stomach spilled violently from my mouth. Dux's wet nose pressed behind my ear, followed by a sloppy wet kiss against the side of the neck. He whined next to me. His claw tips tapped against the tile as he tried to get my attention. I imagined he was trying to encourage me to hide, telling me there was still time to pretend this was all in our heads. How was my dog the only thing making sense at that moment? I pulled myself unsteadily to my feet and dug in my cabinet for something to settle my stomach. I needed to have my wits about me. Thankfully, there was a bottle of Pepto sitting front and center. I've been getting sick a lot lately. Headaches, stomach aches, fatigue. At one point, I thought I contracted COVID. My tests came back negative, so I assumed it was just a regular flu or sinuses. Just wait it out, get some exercise, you'll bounce back in no time. That's what the doctors told me at least. The bottle tumbled from my hand before I could wrap my fingers around the child safety lid. It had been months now since I'd been getting sick, hadn't it? It always seemed to happen on nights like these where rain and lightning battered the earth and when ducks cowed in fear inside the closet. Usually, I tuck into my bed with the covers pulled tightly over my head as I tried to fight nausea. This happened monthly. Sally had mentioned something about it returning monthly. I should have asked her more questions. I needed to know what was happening. Before I could give it more thought, the assault on my front door had abruptly stopped, and the sound of a shattering window in my house made me jump to my feet. I made my way back into the living room and glanced down at the shattered glass on the floor. Ice-cold fear ran like water through my veins. Ducks growled from behind me as the front door opened, and a shaking hand reached up to fiddle with a chain on my door. I sucked in a trembling breath and tugged the door inward against the arm. 
someone on the other side cried out in pain. Behind me, Ducks let out a furious bark, and I heard his nails clicking against the ground as he ran into the kitchen behind me. A person screamed in terror and pain. It was at this moment I realized I was under siege. The enemy, my neighbors, under the influence of an alien bug, were coming at me from all sides. All I had against them was a set of kitchen knives and my normally docile dog, whose survival instincts kicked in under pressure. I was thankful for ducks at that moment. Everyone warned me against having such a large dog in my apartment, but there was a special bond between ducks and me as soon as we laid eyes upon each other. I chose him as much as he chose me. My neighbors wanted me. Ducks was caught up in something that wasn't his fault. At least he'd survive. Before I could doubt my decision, I let go of the door and charged back into the kitchen to find Ducks had his teeth sunk deep into the arm of a neighbor I'd seen a couple of times from down the block. He was a shirtless, tall, old man who wore pajama bottoms as if he'd been relaxing at home before all this craziness started. Ducks shook his head in a savage fury, mauling the man's arm and forcing him to cry out in sheer anguish. Behind the man, I saw the top of a ladder leading into the window of the apartment. Stepping round Ducks and the man, I reached the window in time to see someone else climbing up the window. Below, the whole neighborhood seemed to be out in force in the siege. More people gathered around the bottom of the ladder, waiting their turn to climb in. A brief peek at the front door showed many people were waiting to make the climb up the stairs through the front door. My only saving grace was the bottleneck the stairs and the entrance caused for them. Only one or two people could get into the stairwell at the same time. Running on pure adrenaline and survival instinct, I shoved the ladder away from the window. The man on the ladder shouted as he fell backward along with the ladder back to the ground. With that taken care of for the moment, I had to deal with a man inside the house. The closest item to me I could use as a weapon was my microwave. I unplugged it from the outlet and picked it up over my head. The bald man was on the floor, pleading for Ducks to release him to no success. I dropped the microwave down on his skull and heard the plate inside shatter. The bald man cried out once more. A part of me that still had some sort of attachment to humanity felt terrible about my actions. However, the instinctual part of me, which wanted me to survive at all costs, didn't give a single damn about this man's life. I picked up the microwave again and slammed it on his skull harder than I did before. This time, his cry was cut off, and he didn't stir anymore. Doc seemed satisfied and released the man's mangled, bloodied arm from his mouth. He licked the blood from his face. We were no longer a man and dog. We were primitives battling against an invading force. Whether they were aliens, monsters or men, we weren't about to go down without a fight. The sound of the front door splintering caught our attention and we ran back to find it shaking in its frame. With the blood and adrenaline running through my brain, I realized I needed to barricade the front door. The heaviest items I had in my house were my couches, my television stand, and the refrigerator. As I got to work shoving those toward the front door, Doug stayed near the door, barking aggressively and snarling. I pushed the love seat to the door and yelled for Doug's to get out of the way. That pause doomed me. I felt something crash against the back of my head, and I immediately saw stars. A stinging pain ripped at the top of my skull, and a splattering of fireworks exploded behind my ears. I immediately dropped to the floor. The echoes of Dux's barks were the last thing I heard before I blacked out. When consciousness returned to me, by the time my vision cleared, something was being tugged over my head and tightened around my neck. Several sets of hands gripped each arm and wrenched me up from the floor. Someone shoved me forward and told me to watch my step. Behind me, I heard someone crying out in agony again and the sound of ducks mauling someone new. The thought of it brought a smile to my lips, but it was immediately shot down as a surge of pain ripped across my head. I heard the door shut behind me and paws bashing wildly against the other side. As they pushed me down the stairs, I fought and struggled as well as I could against the group holding me tight. The strength seeped out of me as exhaustion overcame me. 
I had lost. Dux was gone now, trapped inside the apartment. I should have realised they'd had more ladders. They'd probably come inside the house through the bedroom while I was handling the bald man in the kitchen. With the chaos going on outside, the banging on the door, and Dux mauling the screaming bald man, I probably didn't hear the window shattering. When I pushed the couch through the door, they snuck up behind me and knocked me out. At least, that's what I think happened. They could have easily climbed in through the balcony. Either way, I was their prisoner now. Lost in those thoughts, I came back to reality when a hand reached up to brush my cheek through whatever they'd put over me. Don't worry. It was Sally's voice, sweet and matronly. We're just trying to help. After that, I felt the prick of a needle going into my skin, and a moment or two later, I was dizzy. Blackness swirled behind my eyes like the legions of those red insect drones. I gave in to the darkness once more. Foggy consciousness broke through periodically. I was vaguely aware of a bumpy ride and a cold metal floor underneath me. I woke now and again and had dreams of swarming red orbs, impossibly tall trees and rents in the clouds allowing me glimpses of terrible, unspeakable things. Wretched, half-glimpsed creatures who shrieked and buzzed. Ducks was barking furiously at them. I had no idea how long it went on. The shock wore off as we neared the end of the ride. I heard the road turn to gravel for a bit, then something quieter, softer. We ground to a halt, and I smelled damp earth and pine sap. Can you take this hood off, Sally? What the hell's going on? Where are we? What about ducks? I said with alarm. I was still groggy and felt there was no way in hell I could get to my feet. I couldn't see, but if I could, I was sure things would be swirlier than a kid's giant lollipop. I heard Sal's soft voice whisper in my ear. All in good time. We are here to help. All will be revealed. Help? I half barked, half coughed. The chemical, or whatever the hell they used on me, was still making my mind feel like it was buzzing. Who the hell are you helping here, Sally? I felt that stroke again on the hood. Gentle and reassuring, like a mother's touch before she drowns a child in the bathtub. I'm going to give you a minute or two to get your bearings, and then I will show you where we are. I have a little water to soothe your throat as well. The chemicals they give us can be a tad harsh on delicate tissues, Sal said. That they give you? Yes. And just who? I broke into a coffin fit and felt a cold water bottle pressed onto my hand. And just who? the hell are they? We don't have a name for them. They are innominate, but we do know they are here to help. Help make a new home for their kind. Our kind. In this world. We are now them. And we are the second wave that has arrived here. We have combined through the phenomenon you observed in the forest and on our street. You said second wave? What was the first? I asked. Sally gently removed the hood, static crackling in my hair. My vision swam for a bit, then calmed. Sally's face came slowly into focus. Her eyes were glowing the exact shade of red as the insects Dux and I encountered in the forest. The wrinkled skin around her eyes was a bruised variant of the same colour. I felt a wave of nausea rise and subside. Sally was between me and the van doors and was backed by two large men. There was no way out, but through. I recalled someone saying at some point about doing something unpleasant. I thought of Ducks, terrified and alone in my apartment. My best friend, Ducks. I screamed and charged at her and the men, but they quickly picked me up and threw me deeper into the van, the way a kid would toss a doll. I landed on my ass on the hard metal floor of the truck, denting the aluminium. Let's not have any more of that, she said. It's unseemly. Get lost, Sally, I spat. It was the best thing I could muster at the time. Sally tilted her head a bit. Her red eyes blinked. In any case, as I said, we are the second wave. Those who undergo the transformation needed a little... softening up, so to speak. We needed to make sure our vessels were able to receive our gift. 
I shifted to a more comfortable, less agonizing position on the cold and dented metal floor. Gift? That's rich, Sally. You're talking about colonizing Earth. You'll see. All will be revealed. We are here to help. Yeah, help yourself. More or less, yes. So, what was the first wave? Just how did you soften us up? I asked. A nuclear arms race, she said. I felt a shiver course through me. You were going to destroy us all to prepare us? Not exactly. We needed certain conditions to be met upon the planets before colonization. The nuclear fallout spread across the planet from all tests and detonations was needed to prepare your genes and immune systems for the entry of the larvalin stars, those red orbs that you observed. If you'd gotten your dosage as intended, you'd have known all this. You'd have remembered. You'd have been a part of us. Of course, we shall remedy this immediately. We've caught up to the swarm again. We shall take you whole. Sally stepped out of the van. Two men entered the inside of the truck and dragged me out into the night. We were near the woods again, just like how the apartment buildings were near the woods. There was a dampness floating in the air, giving me the impression that it had recently rained here. I thought I'd heard thunder in the distance earlier, but I wasn't sure if it was real or if I'd taken too many hits to the head in such a short time. The men marched me forward deeper into the woods. Sally marched ahead of us, leading the way. Sadly, I was done and resigned to whatever fate awaited me and the rest of humanity at this point. I'd fought them as much as I could already. I'd been hit in the head, drugged and exhaustion had taken hold. There was nothing I could do anymore. I could have tried to run, but I wouldn't have gotten far from them. I allowed them to lead me to my fate. Stop, Sally commanded. She stood beneath a tree and stared upward into it. The red orbs lit the tree like Christmas lights. They chittered and hung their song of violation, their battle hymn of conquest. Sally relished in it. I wanted nothing more than to throw a rocket ahead or something to ruin the moment. Unfortunately, there weren't any sizable stones to throw near us. Sally raised her arms and opened her mouth toward the sky like she was trying to catch a snowflake. From her throat, the same chittering hum came. It was a sound no human could have made on purpose. Her mouth opened wider than it was possible for a person until I heard her jaw pop as it dislocated. The sound was sickening enough to make me want to vomit again, if I hadn't already puked back at home. Dozens of the red orbs seemed to respond to Sally's chittering command and floated down from the tree's leaves. Sally held out a palm, and the creatures swarmed Sally's hand like bees on a hive. She turned back to me with glowing red eyes lighting up her long grey hair. The two men kicked out the backs of my knees, forcing me to kneel on the ground. Sally came over to me, mouth still open wide like an eternal scream. She extended her hand out before me and chittered once more, before I heard the sound of a gunshot tear through the chitters. Lit by the red glow of the swarming alien insects, a dark black hole appeared in the middle of Sally's forehead. A stream of blood flowed down the middle of her face and dropped off the top of her lip to the forest floor, and then she collapsed into a heap in front of me. Two more gunshots rang out and the two men holding me fell over as well. A moment later, humanoid figures emerged from the woods carrying rifles, dressed in all black to blend in with the night. They moved forward with trained precision, aiming their weapons in my direction. While this happened, I saw other people emerge from the woods, and torrents of fire lit the night along with the forest. Men with flamethrowers obliterated the alien swarm in the trees. Their chitters and homes were replaced with what must have been the sounds of their collective screams. The men with the rifles approached with caution. I didn't know what else to do, except put my hands into the air to show that I wasn't armed. Did any of those creatures get into you? One of the men pointing the rifles at me asked. I had trouble finding my words, as I had never had a gun pointed directly into my face. I stuttered a no, and the men helped me to my feet. Didn't think so, said the soldier who'd asked me the question, and led me away. As he did, his companions fired another round into the heads of Sally and the two men who had been assisting her. Who the hell are you guys? 
I asked the man as he escorted me through the woods. You ever watched the movie Men in Black? He asked. I nodded. That's us, minus the suit and ties. I shook my head from side to side and just accepted this as truth. I allowed him to drag me out of the war zone the area had become. We walked through those woods. I saw more and more soldiers with flamethrowers incinerating the woods. The swarm cried out, filling my ears with their terrible sound. It wasn't until the soldier delivered me to a van on the outskirts of the woods that the sound stopped once I got inside. This is where I leave you. They're going to make sure you aren't infected and give you a ride home to your dog. Safe travels. You gave those buggers hell, kid. The soldier said and marched back toward the woods. I had so many questions, but I couldn't handle much more. Inside the van, a doctor in a hazmat suit ran some sort of scanner over my body and deemed me alien parasite free. Once they finished, they removed their gear, and it was a woman who introduced herself to me as Dr. Orchid. Are you feeling alright beside the craziness that happened to you tonight? She asked. I'm... I'm just tired, and I want to get back home to my dog, I answered. With a chuckle, she said. Your apartment complex is in lockdown right now. We've got a clean-up crew vacating your neighbours, so they'll be okay. For tonight, we're going to put you up in a pet-friendly hotel, Dr. Orchid replied. Ducks is okay? I asked immediately, sitting up with second wind. Yeah, he is. He's at the hotel already, waiting for you, Dr. Orchid answered. We left the woods almost immediately and drove back toward my town. Dr. Orchid filled the time talking about the Marvel superhero movies she's watched, and she thinks Star Wars needs to let go of the past so they can move on with the franchise. I sat there, staring at her, and wondering how this woman, who has knowledge of parasitic alien swarms, talked about such mundane subjects. I thought about asking for more information about what was happening, but then decided against it. She acted as if nothing happened. So I assumed it was best to pretend I was getting an Uber ride home from a very talkative driver. When we arrived at the hotel, I could see Ducks inside the lobby. He made his bed on one of the sofas. Get some rest tonight, we'll see you tomorrow morning. And please, don't try to leave in the middle of the night or something like that. We've got the place on watch, Dr. Orchid said, putting back on her professional voice. I told her I'd probably need a wake-up call after tonight, and went into the hotel. Dux jumped out of the couch and ran toward me. He howled with excitement and happiness. Whoever had gotten him had washed off all the blood and gave him a proper grooming. I dropped to my knees, and Dux showered me with kisses. I cried with happiness knowing that everything with him was okay. Excuse me, sir, said the hotel clerk as he hovered over me. I'm sorry, I said and stood from the floor. You're in room 1002 tonight. It's right down at the end of the hallway. If you're feeling hungry, please help yourself to anything in the cafeteria down the other end of the hall that way. Or, if your companion needs to use the facilities, you can take him outside the side door near your room. The clerk explained and handed me the room key. Dux and I immediately went into the room and shut the door behind us. I locked the deadbolt in, yanked off my clothes, and fell into a deep sleep with Dux cuddled up next to me. I have no recollection of these events at all. The last thing I can recall from my own memory is the thunderstorm mentioned in the opening paragraph above. Otherwise, I feel as if I returned to consciousness only minutes ago. All the information I've given, I found on handwritten pieces of paper with a hotel's logo on top. The handwriting was mine. I read over what happened above, and didn't know what to make of it. It seems as if I decided to write a movie or something. I took the pages to read them over clearer when I had the time, and wasn't feeling as if my brain was made out of bread pudding and applesauce. When I went to the hotel clerk, he told me I'd been in the hotel for several days, after some people from my apartment complex had helped me check into the hotel. I asked him why they did that, and he had no answer, as he hadn't been the person who checked me into the hotel at the time. From his expression, I could tell it was probably a weird question for someone to ask why I was there. They don't care why you're there, they only care that you pay and get out on time. Ducks and I took an Uber home with a driver who didn't mind a dog in the car. 
while the driver drove us and pet ducks as much as he could. I checked on my phone and noticed that all my apps and logins weren't saved. I spent a bunch of time logging back into my social media and spent the whole ride checking in on what I'd missed in the world. I hadn't missed much, apparently. When I arrived home, the door was open and everything was in place like I'd left it. There was a note on the table from the apartment complex manager saying that the gas leak was taken care of and they appreciated the time I gave them to fix it. They said they hoped I enjoyed my stay at the hotel they'd booked for me. Feeling sore from sleeping in a random hotel bed for days, I decided I needed to get a good nap in before I went about my day again. Doug seemed a little nervous. He sniffed around a lot and appeared on edge. He sniffed around the closet and doors until he seemed to calm down again. He jumped into bed with me and soon fell into sleep. Finding that I couldn't fall asleep in the middle of the day, I pulled out the papers I'd skimmed earlier and read through what I'd written. I'm not the kind of person who writes for fun or makes up stories, but nothing else explains how I ended up in that hotel room aside from the note left to me by the apartment manager. Has anyone else encountered these red orbs in the night sky? This story was written by users HG Gravy, Dr. Tony Johnson, Hello Hello Help Hello, Xenomorph, and AM Hazard. <laughs>